Hello, Malcolm here, and welcome to the second of our short two-part series on Christianity and racism. The title of this series is taken from Proverbs chapter 1, verse 5, where it says, Let the wise listen and add to their learning. Let the wise listen and add to their learning. And we hope as we talk and pray and work together that we can push back the boundaries of racism as the kingdom comes into our lives and comes through us to influence people around us, starting in the church and then spilling beyond. We hope that more and more healing can come to more and more people, more and more justice can come to more and more people. But where that begins is by listening and understanding. And speaking for myself and many people I know like me who I talk to, the more we can learn how to listen well and learn better how to understand the experiences of people that we don't relate to, that are not our experiences of, of racism, at least in my context, then the better we can be an ally and a help in making a difference to people in our churches and, and beyond. So that's the purpose of these two interviews. Last week with Tony and this week, I'm delighted to say with Jack and Sarah Meisinger. Uh, they are currently members of our congregation up in Birmingham. Uh, I've known Sarah all her life. So I've known her mother for many long years before she was even born. Jack, I've got to know more recently. And they are they provide some very interesting perspectives. Jack is white North American. Uh, Sarah is mixed race, black and white. Her parents are black and white uh, uh, from the UK. And they've been married not all that long. And they have uh, their first child was born just about three months ago. And in fact, baby Leon makes an appearance uh, in this interview. So I hope that you benefit and learn a lot from what you hear. And at the very least, it'll provide a stimulus for our own discussion so that we can learn better how to listen and to understand. So without further ado, let me turn you over to Jack and Sarah. Uh, so th the first thing I was wondering about is what kind of vision you have. The uh, vision that I have is that there would be more conversation about it. I think um, from my conversations with friends and um, in the church, they feel like they can't bring some of their friends to church because the, the issue which is at the forefront of many of their fr friends' minds is not discussed. You know, kind of the evil that the, the world is aware of and is constantly having conversations about, you know, the church talks little about. So for their friends who feel strongly that this is an issue that needs to be addressed and then for them to come to church and hear complete silence on it mm -hmm. and not only you know feel deeply that this needs to be addressed but are also experiencing it for them to hear silence on that topic that's so deeply personal and you know even you know globally con it, 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 there's a global consciousness too for them to not hear anything when they come to church regarding it it gives a sense that Jesus doesn't care you know that this isn't something Jesus cares about, like these real world issues, these real world, real, real world problems. Like if we talk about prayer and we talk about our Bible and we talk about uh, whatever else, we'd also be talking about uh, racial reconciliation issues or understanding as sort of part of the fabric. Is that what you're talking about? We're more used to talking about individual sins and we stay in that area. But even if, and this might be a little bit um, bigger picture, but if we start to talk about some of these bigger, more corporate, uh, more um, those types of cultural sins, I think then we might be able to address even more things, be able to repent in, in a broader sense and, and conform more to, I think, the vision that Christ has for his church to bring. My vision would be for there to be genuine friendships across different races. I think we talk to each other at church, you know, we're not racist, we'll speak to each other, we'll say hi, or, you know, we're in each other's family groups. But I think when you think about your actual circle of friends, your close circle of friends, your the people you turn to, the people, yeah, I, I think... I, I think that breakdown, I think sometimes I think we tend to what's comfortable actually. So I think that's quite telling to actually look at our close circle of friends and do we have people in our inner circle who are of a different race? And I guess I shared that because that's that was, I didn't lean towards that um, and I've noticed that. Obviously I'm mixed race, so I can kind of float, I guess, but I think growing up, I felt more comfortable with black people. I think there was more perhaps black people that I was around. Um, I felt, um, I felt, yeah, more accepted, I guess. Um, I remember when it came to my wedding day, I, I realized like, well, at least when I was thinking about getting married, I was like, all oh, my bridesmaids are gonna be black. 
Um, and I just thought, like, I started praying to have some white bridesmaids just because I just thought, I don't know, like, I don't know why, but it'd just be good for diversity, I guess, <laughs> not just for the pictures. But I think that reflected something is that I lean to, I, you know, and obviously I have, I'm, you know, I have lots of white friends, but in terms of who were my inner circle, it was the people I felt comfortable with. And so I think that would be my vision that we could have uh, genuine friendships across races. First Peter, at the end of chapter one, he says, now that you purify yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. Uh, and I think that is one of those dangers in the Christian life that it's easy to, to settle for sincere love. Mm, yeah. And, and I think in general in the church, we really do have sincere love for each other most yeah. of the time. Right. And that cuts across all the races and cultures and, and class system or whatever. I think that's really true. But then if you're really going to love each other deeply from the heart, you've got to enter each other's world and yeah. world of experiences. What would you say is the biggest spiritual lesson God's taught you through all of what's gone on regarding the race issue over the last year or so? Um, I think for me, it's to carry each other's burdens and, and to choose to engage, I guess. So I think, um, uh, I would maybe want to be supportive from afar, but I think realizing that to be an ally, I can't, I have to kind of get my hands dirty, uh, which means allowing myself to be affected. I think it felt uncomfortable. Mm. It was not nice. It was painful. Um, and this is just from someone listening and hearing and trying to empathize. It's not my actual firsthand experience. Um, so I think for, for me learning that, yeah, Jesus wants me to carry each other's burdens, which means I have to get involved and I have to suffer like her rejoice with those who rejoice mourn with those who who mourn and um yeah i guess looking at god's example that he didn't support us from afar you know that he chose to come down chose to be human to walk in our shoes so that we could so he could connect that's a word that word ally that's come up to be a a, a word that's used more over the last little while could you try and define what you feel that means I don't know what the actual definition is, but I guess how I internalize it, what it means to me is like standing side by side, like in it with someone, um, as opposed to cheering them on from the sideline, like, oh, I, I support you and I don't feel like that. And I'm sorry, that's your experience, but actually kind of getting involved, you know, um, uh, explaining to others um, perhaps what their experience may be like. So for example, um, I know some of my black friends have shared the pressure they feel to be able to help educate everyone else about what their day to day experience is. Mm. Um, but if I could start to empathize and understand, then I can be an ally, give them a break. And I speak on their behalf and say, it's like this. And, and so it's like, really, it's taken on some of the, the burden off of them. And, and that's how I see it side by side. So Psalm 10, verse 18, says, you'll hear the cries of the oppressed and the orphans, you'll judge in their favor, so that mortal men may cause terror no more. And um, I think to some degree, that's the lesson that I learned uh, was to judge in their favor. So I think at times I would hear the cries of the oppressed, but I would come up with various excuses uh, for or explanations of why that could have happened. It wasn't a clear cut case. I was undecided. That was how I was up until last year, or, you know. Um, and it wasn't up until Sarah brought up my lack of concern for the disparity between the welfare of minority groups in COVID cases. Because she said, look at how disproportionate this is. And I said, well, you can't really blame it on this or that. We've got to look at the finer details. And she said, I thought you'd say that. And I said, what does that mean? She said, well, you always have some sort of explanation. And that was me not judging in their favor. And throughout history, the, you know, the, the history of minorities in any situation has not been great. So I eventually got to a place where the evidence was overwhelming. My own wife was bringing it to my attention. And then that's when a switch flipped. And I thought, you know, I, it's not enough for me to hear the cries of the press. I need to judge in their favor as well. And to really accept that those things are valid and to validate people's experiences, to believe them. I think um, being an ally is believing uh, what what people are saying is true, and then also taking action, as Sarah mentioned, 
um, to do something about that, which I think is, is as equally as important because as Christians, we're called not just to, um, uh, to believe, but to also carry our cross and uh, to, to act out the faith that we have. Um, even if that means suffering on other people's behalfs um, for their sake, that's a, that's our uh, premier example we have in Jesus. Yeah. So I think to do anything less than that would be very unchristian. Mm. Well, and that's that's the judgment on Sodom. Ultimately, the judgment on Sodom was not about um, the, the homosexual practices or whatever. Right. The judgment was on they didn't care about the poor. Right. I think is it Ezekiel talks about that. Um, mm -hmm. That that's the thing. It's they didn't care about the marginalized, the vulnerable, and Jesus clearly demonstrated by the way that he lived, not just what he taught, but what how he lived, or in a sense, how he lived taught it that he cares, and he will stand up for, and he will intervene yeah. to to help the vulnerable. The third question I had on that list was about what insights. Uh, being a mixed race couple has given you about Christianity and race. When I met Sarah, I thought she was uh, white. Maybe she had a little bit of Spanish in her or Portuguese uh, or something, the D'Souza. And, uh, and, and I, but I, I, I essentially assumed that she was mostly kind of Caucasian. And, um, and then getting to know her, it started to become clear that it actually had a much bigger influence than uh, I would realize. So for her, it was her uh, black heritage and identity uh, was significant and was a big part of who she was. So even though it didn't look like a, a big difference to me, to her, it was uh, her culture, uh, her, uh, her, a bit of her identity and um, a lot of her experience growing up. So for me, I'm obviously I'm mixed race, so I'm, I'm not fully black or white um, and I can, and I think the privilege of that is I can generally blend um, and it was interesting I was speaking to a friend she's black and she worked in a Jewish care home and obviously J Jews have been marginalized and um, yeah have been here you can have, have been mistreated but what one of the things that she said was Jewish people can also blend too with the dominant you know accepted white you know, a race where she goes for me i walk in and i don't have the option of blending like it's you know i'm black and there are you know i can't choose and i think that really because i have experienced different things but what i realized was i can blend though still i don't and and so i i, I get it. i guess i just want to acknowledge that um as my privilege but i um i think initially um i wanted jack to engage and he shared a little bit about it and i think i felt that um i felt bothered by his ability just to dismiss it um but then he had a radical repentance, started buying all these books on under, trying to understand racism and reaching out to our black brothers and sisters to ask about their experiences and apologizing um, for just not um, not not being racist, but not um, like, I guess, yeah, being an ally or wanting to understand and wanting to, you know, um, and I guess so I was convicted by that because he went the extra mile and I wasn't even doing that. And I think my issue was pride because I'm mixed race, maybe assuming that I already knew, or, you know, I spoke to my, my dad and, you know, he could share his experiences. Um, so I think for me that that's been, I was actually convicted by his, his repentance to really go after it, to understand that challenged me that, um, yeah, to seek to understand more. And was it a specific thing that, that triggered that or was it more like an accumulation? It was, um, it was when she pointed out the disparity in uh, COVID deaths in, minority groups. And, um, and then I said, uh, well, that could be any, any reason, any number of factors that could contribute to that. And she said, I thought you'd say that. And so then I, I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, you always, you never really engage with this stuff. And uh, I thought, oh, that's unfair. But when she said that, and I kind of could see how throughout my whole life, I hadn't really believed, you know, I hadn't, um, judged in favor of the oppressed, as we talked about in Psalm uh, 10, uh, 13, I believe it was. Um, God, you know, God hears the oppressed and he believes them. And throughout my life, I had always sought another explanation. So that just when I looked at the experiences, at the kind of like uh, all, all the evidence throughout the course of my life and, and reevaluated and said, what if I've been judging this all wrong? And in fact, I should have seen this a long time ago. 
you know, if we want to look back on our lives from the perspective of history and think, you know, just like Martin Luther King or William Wilberforce or any number of people who have who have stepped up to the moment that they find themselves in in history to do something um, on behalf of others, you know, then um, then I've got to do something about that now. As someone with a better understanding of black women's issues than I would have, I uh, wondered if you had a particular thought as to what contribution black women can make to this whole conversation about racism. Again, I'll give my perspective is limited from my stance, but I think speaking to a lot of my black friends, I think it's helped me understand even more. It's it's a it's a matter of intersectionality, right? It's the women, uh, you know, already have a difficult time in in various settings. Um, you know, whether it's the workplace or being have an influence and then being black it makes it doubly difficult um to have that um and i think one of the ways that it really connected with me once i started to try to understand their experiences was particularly the pressures that society places on women with regards to um beauty standards or what is desirable um and it was then when i was started to listen to some of my friends realizing that they grew up not seeing themselves as um, what was classified as desirable or what the beauty standards were and how how difficult that is growing up, not seeing yourself in books or on TV or in magazines or models or whatever. And it's interesting because I felt like I could connect with that a little bit. Like I remember feeling um, like amongst, yeah, growing up, my hair is really thick and frizzy naturally. And I remember being in my school or my white friends with had their little ponytails, these really cute blonde ponytails. And mine was like really thick and bushy and not cute. And I used to do gymnastics and the mums were trying to braid my hair and they were like, oh, wow, you've got a lot of hair or this is just really difficult. They'd make these comments which stuck with me as a young, like I felt like I wasn't desirable. Like, oh, this wasn't beautiful. Um, and if I felt like that, you know, I, as I started to listen to these stories, I was kind of like, wow, that, you know that's tough and so i guess i share that because i think i think black women are incredibly strong like i think if you if that's and this is what we discussed like if that's kind of you have to yeah you don't see yourself represented but you have to kind of get your security from somewhere believe you matter believe you can make a difference believe you know all these things i think wow like they're incredibly strong and i think we've got a lot to learn if, we, if you've never had to if you've always seen yourself represented, you haven't had to dig deep in a way that they have had to, um, to just to make it and to do great things um, in society. So I think there's a lot to learn from them, uh, particularly, yeah, I think, I think incredibly strong is what I think. That's, that's profound and it is moving and, and so valuable. So yeah. valuable. We, we need to, to learn how what that means to, to have, in a sense, have to forge your own identity without a role model or without something visible. Yeah. And then how to develop strength and perseverance, and especially as a Christian, to retain a godliness through that when you've had to do that, in a sense, against the tide, I suppose. Or If, um, if black women are marginalized, not just in the world, but in the church, we are missing such an important contribution that should be, you know, working to build us all up. Uh, but we're just not benefit, benefiting as much as we could from. I wondered if you had any advice, any tips, any perspectives for uh, white people. Have you got any tips for me? I suppose is really the question <laughs> here. Uh, how to listen to the experiences of black Christians? I think our egos can get involved um, and we can start taking it personally for whatever reason i think if somebody says this is my problem men are not hardwired to empathize they're kind of thinking like what well what's your problem mm -hmm. and if i can fix it for you then i don't need to listen to you right. you know if i can give you an explanation for why that happened or tell you how to handle that differently next time then i don't need to listen to your experience and so i would just stay away from the kind of thing the types of responses that are going to shut down the conversation which would be things like saying but did they mean it that way mm. or are you sure you interpreted that right or what if if you had done this maybe you were i was just hearing a story today of one of my co-workers who was coming from his office that he, he was wearing green the cop a uh, green track suit the cops pushed him up against the shangling links fence and um and then they got a radio 
call in that said the suspect was wearing a black uh, black tracksuit, and 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 they just assumed since you know he was black that it was the right suspect without the description matching the color of the tracksuit. So anyway, you know, then I could I could think well maybe if you had been more verbal, you know, vocal at the beginning or asked the question more direct. But then I'm like, what am I thinking? You know, I just need to listen and understand and believe. And my first response should not be think because that's never happened to me, not even close, you know? And and so just the quickness that I have to just get into this kind of defensive, uh, I think it's some sort of e ego defense mechanism. Avoiding, okay, so being alert to the, the sense in myself, you're talking about if it's me, you know, like, okay, I'm feeling defensive. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, okay. That's a sign for me to keep quiet for a bit longer here and listen more. And I think the first, what helps me is I'll stay like that until I vocalize my support. And so until I say, oh, that stinks. Like, I'm sorry that happened. Well, sometimes it doesn't feel natural for me to say because I just don't generally communicate on that level. That's not, I don't usually just uh, relate, relate and empathize. I'm generally trying to find a solution or explain something. So if I can do that, then I can start to feel more empathetic. And then I, then that can, we can take that conversation further because, you know, for my friend at work, he's even waiting. Is, is he going to, how's he going to respond to this? So when I respond with empathy, that conversation can go deeper. So even if I'm in that moment, thinking about a lot of different things, deciding I'm going to empathize, this conversation goes deeper and my heart goes there with it. Mm. Um, and that conversation came after he made a comment and he said, life is like a box of chocolates nobody likes the black ones Ooh. and uh right. so i followed up with him today about that and i was like that, you know was that coming from a place was that coming from an experience and um and so it's been good we've been able to have these conversations and, and my hope is that he can see me as a person who cares and wants to hear but that's so, a good testimony to to the attitude you're talking about because you could have written off that comment as meaning nothing yeah. or you could have decided it was too sensitive an area to go to Mm -hmm. or any number of other reasons, you know, really excuses, but reasons to not um, not come back to him. But the fact you did, it, that's got to be something that hopefully tells him you care. I think, um, I guess, not being entitled uh, as well, as we seek to understand, like not being entitled to um, black people having to explain their experience, again and again a lot of them are tired you know it's tiring to do that to um so i think whilst yes seeking to understand but also it's yeah not feeling entitled to them explaining actually we need to educate ourselves um and take ownership of that and mm, that's something that's good point. that i have been learning through all of this like okay like rather than they're just tired and so i asked i asked one of my friends what where's a good place for me to start and she recommended the book um why i why i hate talking to white people about race um so i, I got that and i started that um but i think yeah i think it's just again taking the pressure of while seeking to understand us also going out of our own way to educate ourselves so that we can come into the conversation with not expecting just to be fair but with something um i think that would probably go a long way That's well. great. Yeah. Right. So take your own initiative. Don't wait for people to come to you and don't think you have to make people talk about it or that that's the only way you're going to learn. But look for other ways to learn. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So you're bringing something already to the conversation if you do have the conversation. Not that you're saying, oh, I've, I've read a book. Now I understand. Yeah. Uh, but more, I have some context with perhaps within which then to ask better questions. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that probably would go a long way if you've already shown, look, I'm trying to understand this. This is what yeah. I've read is this is this your experience is it different or how does it, it just shows i think it's it's sincere it's it you've gone out of your way i guess is there anything else we didn't talk about that you feel like you want to make sure you, you get across i guess um i've want to just put a disclaimer out there i feel like i'm very much still in the process of figuring out what this looks like for me to engage meaningfully um because it, you know the history of racism in our western culture is systemic and, and deep and uh and the negative consequences are uh you know fast and so figuring out how can i engage with those in a meaningful way um in a practical way that's going to have an impact and be helpful um it's kind of the place that i'm at now um so that, so i don't want to communicate that 
uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm at some end point or I've figured it out. And I think perhaps even asking, you know, ask our black brothers and sisters, how can I stay connected to what this is like for you? Like, you know, would it, because I, I don't know if you'd like want to ask questions every, you know, every few months or whether that's appropriate. I don't know, but I think it's being willing to learn with them. We, you know, we're and showing that interest. Um, I can't tell you how, for me, something like this is very refreshing. Yeah. It, it really helps me because it helps me on an issue. It helps me personally thinking about the racism issue. It helps me be better equipped to help other people. Um, and it's refreshing on a personal level in the sense that I'm, I'm learning from you and I'm, I'm, I'm discovering new things and I value who you are and what you're bringing to the kingdom and currently to the Birmingham church. I, I, I you know, we can't underestimate the significance of the, of the thinking that we all do. And you, you've done a lot of thinking. And that thinking gives you a, a foundation of something solid on which to explore. And hopefully, as you say, bring healing. And, and that's the vision. You know, one of the verses that means a lot to me in all this is, is the Revelation 7 vision of um, the great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne, before the Lamb, wearing white robes, holding palm branches, crying out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our god and salvation and i think in that broadest sense of of healing right that's yeah. really kind of what it's talking about there i think salvation belongs to our god who sits on the throne to the lamb the healing of the nations as it talks about in Isaiah yeah. and in revelation and there's no chance that's going to happen unless we're talking and learning from each other and to see even how christianity has played a role in you know there would probably be not not be such a focus on uh, the dignity and value of individual human beings. If it wasn't for Jesus, you know, and his contribution to Western thought 2,000 years ago, uh, we wouldn't be talking about these things now, but it seems like God's kingdom has steadily been progressing and advancing and changing even culture to bring, you know, society to a place that is a bit closer, perhaps, to Revelation 22 and Revelation 7, uh, but won't get there fully until, until, um, until God brings it about but we can do a part. Yeah, well, we've all got a part to play and it's all very valuable. Yeah. Well, um, shall I pray? Is that all right if I pray for us all? And then um, hopefully Leon can find uh, some yeah, peace. Yeah, pray for him to just uh, get some yeah, uh, shut out here. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, I will. Okay, let's pray. Thanks ever so much, Jack and Sarah. I really appreciate the time you put aside and uh, taking care of baby Leon at the same time. What's your reaction to what you heard? What stood out to you? What was meaningful to you? What might you do a little differently now that you've heard some of the things that Jack and Sarah had to say? Uh, feel free to leave a comment uh, wherever you hear or see this recording. And if you've got any questions you'd like to send my way or any suggestions for future interviews or classes or things to, in to investigate, then please drop me a line, malcolm at malcolmcox.org. Thanks very much. Take care. Thank you.